Good morning. I'm Congressman Darrell Issa. I've represented uh, San Diego and Orange County now for almost 18 years, and I'm here at the Consumer Electronics Show, a place I, I left when I left my business career 17 plus years ago. And you've been coming to the show for how long now? 37 years. It's interesting because in the last year, the way that Congress approaches tech has changed dramatically, right? It feels like the honeymoon is over. With compare, you know, when you take the Russian interference concerns, when you take all of the debate over privacy and security, do you think that that, like the the favored son of the government type thing, is over? You know, there's always been two problems that tech has faced. One is they've been naive about the impact government could have on their on their business models, uh, and that's obviously coming to play uh, every day. The other one is that uh, for a long time, tech had a tendency to be all together united for common things, free trade, uh, liberal immigration of tech workers, better education. But now we've begun seeing various aspects of tech, like you saw in net neutrality, where one group is pitted against another and they go to government to argue it out. That almost always means the honeymoon is over because no matter what government does, they're answering one side or the other side's preferences. You've announced that you're leaving Congress, right? You well, were I'm announcing that I that, that, you're uh, that, the, end post. Of, that the end of the term, uh, I will I will Not be moving seen. on. Without your voice, and you were a point person for Trump on tech is an issue when he was president elect, right? And during the transition, losing that voice, what do you think happens? How does tech talk to the, the Republican establishment in charge? Well, decades ago, we moved the, the, uh, the Supreme Court out of the Capitol, and the assumption was if they moved that across the street, they, uh, they'd be irrelevant. Uh, the court has only grown since it had an independent voice and an independent location. Uh, I'm not leaving tech, and I'm not leaving being a voice. And as long as the president and, and people advising him uh, still listen to my view on H-1B reform, or on, uh, on, quite frankly, on feeding uh, tech's demand to do here what we want to do here versus exporting opportunities, uh, I'll be there and I'm going to continue. I'm not selling my house in Washington. I'm not going to be a lobbyist, but I'm certainly going to be an advocate for the things I believe in. This last year, one of the other things that's been going on in tech and Trump, which a lot of the conversation is that we've seen the tech executives coming out against him in many different ways when it came to the uh, travel bans, when it came to transgender rights, right? We had, we kept Look, a list on CNET of right. every one of the times they criticized And I appreciate him. that liberals will never like Trump. Well, uh, and, and, and no, hear me out. Uh, look, this is about liberals not liking Trump. Sure. The travel ban had so little to do with, with tech. They were uh, people, especially the second one, people who were, uh, were not coming to accept jobs at Apple. Uh, they were not part of it. It's, uh, the, you know, you're not, you're not having that challenge. Uh, but having said that, those, those politics are never going to change. I've never gotten a check from Apple supporting me, and yet I've been one of their champions on issues. And that's okay. You, your politics and your policies don't have to always match. So, is free trade important to, uh, to the tech community? Yes. Is a Democratic Party a protectionist party? Yes. Uh, is, is tech unionized? No. Is the Democratic Party the party of unions? Yes. Uh, so you have all those issues in which people's politics and policies don't match. And I think it's important to, to understand that it shouldn't be about politics when it's about the best interests of the American people. You should be able to pick a party for whatever reason you want and pick policies, if you will, a la carte. So in this case, this administration may never be the choice of the executives of high tech, but it can, in fact, be good for the tech community, good for employment. Now, this president probably appreciates more the building of hotels uh, and, and older technology than he fully understands what goes on in Silicon Valley or what goes on in the biotech areas of San Francisco and San Diego, and yet the policies can be consistently good for those industries. And I think that's where somebody in my position, uh, who perhaps agrees with the president on some things, not on others, can bring the alignment of the policies that are good for the United States. I would certainly say that tech leaders uh, who are officers of public companies uh, are really ill-advised to make those statements because those statements 
quite frankly, are required to be in the best interest of their stockholders, and often they're not. Net neutrality, we saw the vote happen. There's been a lot of backlash specifically from this area of the world when it comes to the tech stuff. So where, where are you kind of feeling at this point now that we see this debate happening again and again? Well, you know, uh, obviously you have a view and it's biased because you just said there's a backlash. Well, there's not just a backlash, there's also a relief rally. Uh, the, the changing of the control and the managing of, if you will, access to bandwidth uh, was in fact one side lobbying for a benefit to them as they saw it. Uh, the reality is that I, uh, I do video conferences every day over the internet. I use exclusively voice over IP. And you better believe I want a prioritization. And net neutrality implies that you won't give me a prioritization for those over other traffic. Uh, in a typical home when your Apple iPad decides that it wants to upload uh, to back up uh, uh, you know, your iPad, guess what? Your VOIP doesn't work right unless you have a prioritization, which should be a smart switch uh, that's able to differentiate that traffic. So, I think there is a difference between quality of service controls and net neutrality, though. Well, you say there is, but the reality is the FCC said, we will determine all of that, we will, rather than unfair competition rules will determine it. You know, for, uh, for decades, we have had the Federal Trade Commission have the ability to look at both monopolistic behavior in, per se and unfair trade practices and intervene. Uh, if there needs to be more of that, I'm all for it. But the idea that you would move something that is vaguely communication to the FCC uh, was a power grab by one chairman. And so I'm absolutely on the other side of it. And I think in the long run, uh, the companies, and I, uh, I'm, I'm considered a friend by virtually all of them, uh, in the long run they're going to find that enforcement of unfair competition is much more inter interesting way to, uh, to protect themselves. You know, and it, by the way, it's not a new issue. No. Uh, uh, during the classic question of, I'm the outdoor channel, but I'm, I'm going through a cable company that has a in-house uh, competitor and they treat me unfairly, uh, those issues uh, have been issues that Congress has looked at and the FTC has an obligation to look at for a long time. And, uh, you know, stronger enforcement, maybe. But just throwing it upside down because it's slightly different than the past uh, was a mistake. I'm glad it's rolled back. Uh, but now the question is, will we get the Federal Trade Commission to step up at the plate and be aggressive on every, if you will, viewed slight that may occur so that there's a fair investigation and when appropriate action. I think that's definitely something a lot of people agree with. And to be clear, my point of view, we're talking about we're talking about surveys that show overwhelmingly Americans were against that move. And so it's not about me. Yeah, I know I, I appreciate I appreciate <laughs> I don't want to be called biased when it's well, literally surveys out there are saying a vast majority of people are against it. But you know what? That's a bad If you ask somebody if they're pro choice, they say, well, everyone's for choice. If you ask somebody if they're in the abstract, if you ask them if they're for net neutrality, you've already you've already gamed it. If you ask, are you for the government determining uh, what priorities are, bandwidth, uh, who can or cannot get an advantage, whether or not I can get a low cost, uh, low bandwidth, will somebody else pays more to get more, uh, that I pay a premium to get a shorter latency time, will somebody else says I'm not, in, I'm not as worried about that and I'd like the discount. If you ask them if they want those choices of plans and different economics to go with it, they're going to say yes. So, yes, net neutrality sounds great, but if you actually break it up and say, would you like to have choice to be able to, if you will, get a lower cost for a lower service or a higher cost so that you can get a preferred service that gives you something better, people are always going to say, of course I want that. Yeah, and I, I think just to challenge that a little bit, the surveys often actually split up net neutrality versus what it was described as, and we can debate what it's described as, but that was when those things changed and people were overwhelmingly supportive of not pulling it back. So I'm curious then, I, I imagine I know the answer already, but the calls for Congress to cement this so that we don't end up back and forth and back and forth and Congress makes a decision that it votes on and it's over. 
you're not you're not in favor of that. You know, I'm not, and I'll tell you why. Uh, these institutions need to be overseen. They need to do their job, and there needs to be, if you will, not a guarantee that it's their job whether they do it right or wrong. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission has tried to get itself, for example, into every time somebody gets hacked, they decide that they're going to go in and essentially tell them for 20 years how to run their businesses. Uh, that practice uh, is probably outside of the unfair competition portion. Uh, they, they have habitually victimized victims, sometimes falsely. Uh, our, our, my old committee investigated it and found that there was excess there. So but there are times when like Uber didn't tell people for a year that it had been hacked and then you have people whose information is out on the internet and they don't know anything and the government's not stepping in to do anything about that. Well, there's a good example where, first of all, there are civil remedies and those are being pursued yeah. uh, and for an amount greater than Uber's capital uh, worth. We'll see how that plays out. Yeah, so, uh, well, but, you know, the laws are in place to make people whole, at least up to the worth of the company. Uh, but, you know, the Federal Trade Commission is, uh, is not about finding people when they fail to disclose, uh, they've gone after uh, people who were in fact had active break-ins, mechanical break-ins where they, and, uh, and they were simply victims. So, uh, you know, it's important when you look at the government who has, by the way, not told you when they've been hacked, not told you accurately that my social security, my medical records uh, are, are out there with somebody. Uh, so, you know, one of the challenges there is we can all say we should have, but the question is when should Congress write a law, how stringent should the law be, and in fact, will it accomplish anything to reduce the amount of times in which people's you know, personal information is made public or stolen? So it's interesting because the CIA disclosure was a big discussion this year, right? They had the, they had the, the vulnerabilities that were released on the web, a lot of companies had to scramble to fix that. So on some level, it creates a question of, well, okay, it's okay for them to try, to try and figure out, you know, get into terrorist phones and whatever. But once they find them and they hold on to them and then suddenly it gets released, we're all in danger. You know, it's a dangerous world out there. Uh, if the CIA doesn't do its job, uh, people will kill us. People will bomb our embassies. People will attack uh, Americans. So. Uh, that's just a reality that we, we know exists today. And so there's a balancing act. Of course there is, yes. But there's no balancing act on the Constitution. It reads as it reads, and it has to be respected as it is. Uh, and until three quarters of the states, uh, in addition to a supermajority of the Congress, changes that, uh, our job is to stick to it. And, uh, you know, particularly on the Fourth Amendment, which is what we're, we've been debating. We've got the gun show coming up in a few weeks here, too half the size, less than half the size. Um, it's interesting. It's like, a small arms industry. <laughs> so the interesting thing, like I have many friends in the military. I have spent my time on a gun range. Like, but what's curious is that smart guns, technology that could potentially help save officers' lives and protect other people's lives. We don't see much of that here. We don't, we saw one gun last year. Um, you know, the, we obviously have a very, this location has special, significance considering the last few months? Well, so how do we you know, deal with this? We can have all those discussions anytime you want. Yeah. The, the question I'll get back to you is, when are police going to only carry smart guns themselves? Because the greatest single hazard to a policeman, whether we like it or not, is his own firearm. That's uh, my point. And right? so, a smart you know, gun could protect them. And so when we look at smart guns, before we start saying they have to be everywhere, the very expensive weapons that we're willing to buy for law enforcement should in fact be officer specific as soon as possible. The technology is maturing and I would hope that we'll see that. Uh, you know, the same is beginning to happen uh, in, in military development, uh, not necessarily in, in a pistol, but in the larger weapons being inherently more secure. After the loss of so much weaponry uh, that the Iraqis had, uh, our ability to have to fight against our own equipment has taught us that there's a need to be able to neutralize. I think a lot of people agree with you. And so I guess the question is, why hasn't the tech industry stepped up? Why haven't you written a purchase order? Well, um, I'm not the military, but... <laughs> well, there's a police force in San Francisco. Have they written a purchase order? 
Uh, I can't speak to it, but well, why don't you? You live in San Francisco. I do. Well, then I suggest you lobby uh, your police force because they could be the first in the country. You could do a, a, a whole question of if the technology exists, why wouldn't uh, the San Francisco Police Department be the first in the nation? The, you know, this this is an industry that will show you what is possible, and will supply you what you're willing to buy, and uh, and so. I'm not going to be at that show, uh, you know, coming up, but uh, I'm sure that each of those uh, manufacturers will tell you the same thing. You give me a purchase order, I'll deliver your product. Sure. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care.